What's up, Navigating Academia family? I hope you guys are doing great. My name is Dr. Jay Phoenix, your personal academic mentor and specialist in all things related to getting into graduate school in the behavioral health sciences, from psychology to social work to counseling to psychiatric nursing to psychiatry. I'm your guy. If you need help getting into a program, I'm your dude. You can go ahead and contact me down via the website below. Today, we're going to be talking about this phenomenon of what the hell is going on when it comes to how many freaking people are applying to be able to get into master's and doctoral programs in the behavioral health sciences, in particular, clinical psychology. Uh, as you guys may know or not, uh, application rates are exploding in the behavioral health sciences, particularly for anything that has to do with becoming a licensed clinician. So if you're talking about cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, we're not really talking about that. We're talking about clinical psych PhDs, PsyDs, MSW programs, uh, MAs in counseling, clinical counseling to become certified mental health clinicians, uh, sorry, counselors, and so forth, okay? Uh, this is something where, trust me on this one, rates have always been low. Clinical psych PhD programs, we're talking less than 10%. For the better programs, 4%, right? So really one out of 25 people was getting in anyway. Now this number is ranging anywhere between 0.5 to 2%. 50% decline at a minimum. What the F is going on here, right? Uh, and essentially, uh, I've thought about this a lot. I've helped over 100 of you guys this past year, usually over multiple sessions, to be able to do everything from career planning to grad school prep to postdoc application prep to tenure track faculty position prep. Some of you guys are finishing your master's theses or doctoral dissertations, and you want somebody to do a mock uh, defense with. I specialize in that as well. Anything having to do with academia, I'm your guy. And it's one of these things we're working with so many of you. A lot of you guys have told me just how frustrated you are with this situation. And a few of you recently have been telling me that last year, zero people, no one from your entire department's cohort of undergrads got into a program. Nobody, right? And everybody knows in these programs that there's always a few people who just seem made in the shade, right? They got everything going on. They're 100% going to, you know, get in, in your opinion, nothing, right? And, and this is the practical reality of things these days. You know, I have a number of friends. If you watch the channel, you watch my other videos, I tell stories about colleagues of mine who are chairs of really, you know, top 20 clinical psych programs, PhD programs in the United States. And at the end of the day, they're all talking about even having to use things like random number generators to decide who gets interviews because there's too many qualified people who are applying this is a gigantic issue, okay? So how on earth did we get here? One of the reasons why is the pandemic taught most of us, I know it taught me, that life is short. It made us recognize that, right? It really made us confront our own humanity. And if life is short, then we really need to chase our dreams. Now, keep in mind that when I say chase your dream, I'm a very pragmatic person. When I say chase your dreams, I don't mean throw caution to the wind and just do whatever you feel like. It's a terrible idea, right? Go in with your eyes wide open. No, you should not be dropping a quarter million dollars of student loan debt to be able to get a degree that maybe in your state, average amount of money that's getting earned is fifty-five to $65,000. A lot of people think that being a clinical psychologist is getting paid as much as an MD medical doctor. It is not even in the same ballpark, okay? Maybe 1% right, of psychologists are making MD psychologist money, and usually this is because these psychologists are hyper-specialized, right? They're writing reports for the courts, for example, and they've been doing it for 20 years so they get all the opportunities, so on and so forth. When you're a starting psychologist, a starting social worker, a starting counselor, especially if you're starting your own private practice, it takes a heavy amount of temporal investment in terms of time as well as startup capital. And so at the end of the day, usually you're going to be in the red. You're going to be going into debt for at least the first year, maybe even the first two years, right, just to be able to get out of that stage. So it's important that if nothing else, you have some savings stored up or you have some investors, which at the end of the day, you're probably not going to want, to be honest, if you're starting a private practice. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is something where just like a startup, usually it takes three to five years to be able to kind of get your sea legs, as they say, to be able to start everything up to the point where you can kind of, you know, quit your real job to be able to make this your real job, right? So it's something important to be able to take into consideration. But remember that Henry David Thoreau quote, which I will now thoroughly butcher, which is, don't fret if you built castles in the sky. That's where they're supposed to be. Build foundations underneath them, okay? If you have lofty dreams, that is not a bad thing, okay? Lofty dreams are how I've succeeded, how anybody who's had an iota of financial success has succeeded, right? 
But it's important to be able to consider the practicalities. Everyone, when they get into a new career field, is naive. Naive is not bad. Naive is good insofar as it will keep you motivated, right, to be able to keep going forward, even if the odds of success are very low. My first company that I ended up selling uh, when I was 30, I started it when I was 27. And oh my gosh, guys, the odds of a 20, somebody in their 20s who's CEO actually being able to successfully sell their first company is 1.7%. That means I had a 98.3% chance of failure, right? But I still gave it my best go and I was able to actually do it. But I am the exception. I am not the rule. Too many of us these days think about possibilities and not probabilities. So it's important that we go into these things with our eyes wide open. We know all the data and then we make the decision in terms of whether we want to do stuff or not. But regardless, for today's video, just make the assumption that a lot of people are quitting their jobs they're saying, I really have, oh, I always want to be in behavioral health. And maybe in the past, I had a social worker. I worked with a counselor. There was a psychologist when my parents got divorced or whatever that I saw helped me out so much. I want to do that. I want to give back. I love people. I want to help people. And this is the route that they've decided to go, which is great, right? Uh, but the thing that's not great is that now we have this massive flood of applications, okay? The other thing that's happening though, right? Or I would say two things. First is related to the first one, a lot of people are switching careers. Right. So maybe they were in the law and all of a sudden they want to be in psychology. Right. Or maybe they were nurses. Right. But they don't really want to focus so much on the medical side anymore. They want to do a lot more of the counseling. So now they want to get an MA in counseling, whatever it happens to be. Right. Whatever that switch is. Okay. But some of these folks, they already have a bunch of publications and they have years of clinical experience. And in some cases, they have years of research experience working, let's say, at a hospital and them applying versus, you know, like, you know, Phoenix McGee at, you know, age 20, 21 applying with barely any experience compared to people with 10, 15 years, my chances of getting in are way lower because of that. And so because of that, a lot of the folks who traditionally would have a better chance don't have as good of a chance. And that's really frustrating. And I totally get it. I commiserate with you, I promise, right? This is the reason why I work with so many of you guys to optimize your materials because a lot of people think that their stuff is good enough to get in and they've asked their supervisor and they've asked their friends and their family members and everybody's like, 100%, you've got it all done. And then they send me the materials and I look at it. I'm like, I don't know who is telling you guys these things, but, but it needs significant work. Right. I mean, I have never worked with anybody where the materials were dead on. Everything was fine. We always need to optimize everything. And that's a good thing. You want somebody independent who has nothing to gain. Right. From helping you get into these programs. Right. It's not that you're going to, you know, like become BFFs with the person. You don't have to worry about hurting the other person's feelings. If you're really straightforward, and you say, listen, we really need to re- rework this personal statement. This is not going to work for you. Right. And watch, obviously, all the videos on the channel as well, because I give you guys a lot of advice. I try to give out as much free game as I can on the channel. Right. Um, So that's one thing. The other thing, though, is that uh, with uh, again, there's a load of these applications coming in to top ranked programs because traditionally they require the GRE. Now, last year, this year as well, GRE for most programs is not being required or it's optional. To be honest with you, I think you should take the GRE if it's optional and you test Well, you know, you're good at taking tests. And even if you don't take tests well, I would still cram for it, take it, see how you do. Don't say at the end. Usually they'll say, hey, we'll we'll send it to a few schools for free. Nope, right? Find out what the score is. If it's at or above the median for that program, then it's something where you can submit it. Otherwise, don't. Why? Because it's something other people aren't going to have. You need to get as much stuff that other people don't have to get into these programs. Most important of which are personal connections as well as publications. These things take years to be able to get. A personal connection is not sending somebody an email and telling them that you love their stuff. Okay, and then them writing back and saying, oh, great. Well, thank you so much. You've got an impressive CV. I'm looking forward to reading your stuff. That is not a personal connection, guys, okay? Everybody and their mother does that. Virtually every faculty member I know, right, has some kind of a copy-paste mechanism where they say that just the same freaking thing in every single email to anybody who writes them. Thank you so much for your message. Uh, excited to read your materials. Um, yes, I am accepting a student this year. Looking forward to, you know, reading through your stuff. You know, best wishes, whatever the person is. And then usually people like me, because I used to get a lot of those emails from people when I was applying to grad school, you know, two decades ago. 
Uh, oh my gosh, guys, I was just like, oh my gosh, they love my stuff and these sorts of things, right? But luckily, my target supervisors, I started building strong relationships with them my freshman or sophomore year. And I continued to build those reputations for years. So if you're watching this video, guys, and you're a freshman or you're a sophomore, now is the right time to start planning. I've got over five of you guys right now who I love to death, all of you guys. You're my psychologist in training, my pit crew, my psychologist in training, right? Uh, PIT. And what I do with you guys is you know, and if anybody's interested in joining the pit crew, let me know. These are freshmen and sophomores who we end up getting together, right? We end up doing a session once a semester, right? To be able to plan that semester out. What courses are we going to take? And I explained the reason why we're going to take those courses, the grades we need to get, and basically step-by-step step how we're going to find these target doctoral programs and then prepping you guys to be able to get into them because freshman and sophomore year is the time to strike. So if anybody's interested in getting involved in my pit crew stuff, just leave a message below and you guys can you know send me a direct email as well. And you can take a look at my website down here below, which has all the you know pricing details for sessions and these things. But I, I really like to start with people then because if it's something that you're already a junior or a senior, honestly, if you have haven't even started developing personal connections it's a problem sorry right it's a problem the person with strong personal connections can have a lower gpa lower gre lower everything but if they're known liked and trusted by the target supervisor that person will be chosen right and there's also now a huge number of individuals who are applying for these internal candidate positions like lab managers and so forth, right? You can watch my videos on how to become an internal candidate, which in my opinion is the best way to get into grad school if you don't have the right GPA, publications, personal connections, and so forth. It'll take you one to three years being in those positions, but you'll end up being where you want to be, okay? So these are the big reasons why there's like this massive influx. The last thing that I'll mention just briefly is that understandably, guys, the COVID-19 pandemic brought about uh, the manifestation of a lot of mental health symptomatology in individuals. And as that's happened, a lot more people, especially because of the proliferation of uh, telemental health services. God, that sentence made me sound good, right? Uh, (laughs) Telemental health services made this something where a lot of people now have access to mental health care. And so as they've worked, maybe for the first time with behavioral health care professionals, they're like, whoa, this helped me so much. I never worked with anybody in the past, but now I think this is what I want to go into. Okay. And this is another reason I'm convinced that the application numbers are through the flipping roof. Okay, so it's one of these things. Is it hard to get into programs now than it was, you know, three, four years ago? Even then, it was really, really tough. Remember, getting into a clinical psych program in terms of a PhD, especially, is much more difficult than getting into medical school if you based on the numbers. Uh, Same thing when it comes to PsyD programs. If you want to get into one of the funded or partially funded programs, because there's only a few. It's like Baylor, Rutgers, I think maybe one or two more now is starting to offer some kind of uh, supplemental funding. I got videos on funding for society so you can watch those uh, those videos as well i help a lot of people get into society programs and it's one of these things where you know a lot of people that's the number one complaint i'll make a video on it as well in terms of student loan debt but oh my gosh guys it's just one of these things where i understand the frustration i'm sorry you guys have to go through it the best thing we can do is to maximize the efficacy of your materials so if you guys ever want any help with that again down here you guys know where to find me All right, guys, that's what I got for you today. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.